Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Deputy Editor. And now when we talk about the labor force in India, recently especially large parts of the discussion have focused on the formal workers. That is the people who have been registered under EPFO. And within that, there's been a lot of discussion about people who have NPS or, you know, who would be eligible for the Unified Pension Scheme. But all of this is a very small part of our workforce. A much larger segment is the informal worker in the formal workspace. So to discuss their issues, the plight of these workers, because we have a broad understanding of the numbers, but the quality of this employment is what not many people know about, and it's important to discuss. So to lead us in this discussion, we have with us Sonvi Khanna, who's the lead at Social Compact, which works a lot with these kinds of workers, with companies that hire these kinds of workers, and works with them to improve the plight of these workers. And so they were sure to get a lot of insight from her. Thank you so much, Ms. Khanna, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So now I know that we said that we have the broad numbers in place. But before we start about the plight of these workers, could you tell us a little bit about what do we mean by informal workers in the formal workspace? And, uh, you know, what is the size of this worker population? Yeah, sure. So we're talking of roughly 200 million workers who are informally engaged within the formal sector. That's okay. the lingo we use because uh, whether or not they were meant to be covered by any kind of safety nets, they are not covered and that's why informality. Right. Right. Uh, whether or not they were meant to have job contracts, they don't have it. That's why informality. Mm -hmm. And that's the bedrock of the vulnerability also that these workers experience, despite being a part of the formal industrial right. uh, sector. We particularly, because we get into action with industries, we particularly define them for ourselves as workers who are contractually engaged with an industry, mm -hmm. as uh, support functions or on the shop floor. Uh, in core tasks, as well as those who are uh, fixed term or temporarily engaged within industry right. on certain roles. And then last but not the least, those who are in the supply chains. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we call working with the informal workforce within the formal sector. So was I right in saying then that uh, these are not the people who are covered under the, the payroll data that comes out from the government, the EPF data? When they say that our formal workforce has increased, these people are not counted in this. They should be. Right. Uh, they should be on the roles of the contractual workforce. They should be on the ESIC roles of the contractor. Uh, but that's not often what we see. Right. For instance, in um, you know some of our experience, we experience 2% companies have contractors who provide an appointment letter to their contractual workforce. Just 2% which is satisfactory by any stretch of the imagination. You know, an appointment letter that will actually stand if you go to take a loan against it, right? right? Or an appointment letter that is with you uh, and explains to you what are the details of your engagement, how many hours, what overtime, at what rate, what leaves, mm -hmm. that kind of detail, right? So technically speaking, these should be workers because they're in the formal sector. They should be somebody's employee and therefore covered under the necessary safety nets by that employer, whether it's the right. contractor or it's the principal company or the supplier. But that needn't necessarily be the case. And this actually blew up in our face. And, you know, we became familiar with it during the pandemic, which is also the point at which the social compact was conceived, mm -hmm. because that was the point when we realized that so many people cannot be on the roads just by virtue of being informal sector workers. Many of them were part of industry supply chains, but because the necessary coverage of these uh, you know, safety nets was not with them, many of them had 300 rupees in their pocket and had to take a decision whether to walk back home or eat the next meal. Right. And I'm guessing that that's also why, number one, our, uh, our formal sector workforce looks so small. It's because... There might be people engaged with these companies, but they're not being counted, right? Yeah, so a supply chain by just giving you ballpark numbers mm -hmm. for one worker, one blue collar worker on my payroll, for instance, as a principal company, I could have anything between three to five X workers in my contractual space and about eight to 10 in the supply chain that then make that entire industrial chain possible, right? So that's the ratio of those you would see or those who would feature in, say, the 
salary discussions that you benchmarkings that you see out there, right? right. Whereas those eight x, ten x workers are not today visible in a way that you can compare, see, gather insight, and really take action. So then, how is it that uh, I mean, how has Social Compact gone about getting information about these workers? Have you done surveys or studies? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of. Uh, a, a two second on how we were conceived because that sure. is how the whole journey began. We were actually conceived, uh, we were incubated by Dastra, uh, a non-profit organization mm -hmm. uh, that brought together industry leaders such as Farhad Forbes, Mehr Padamji, Pradeep Bhargava, mm -hmm. uh, Rati Forbes, right? Uh, and in uh, worker NGOs such as Ajivika Bureau and Center for Social Justice. Uh, into a co-solutioning relationship. Everybody was in a state of shock at that time, right? This is the pandemic. This is the pandemic. The f it to be precise, the first wave of the pandemic, right? right. When there was that massive exodus of yeah. migrants uh, on the roads. And the, the, the butt of the conversation was that we feel, this is what the industrialists shared, that we feel that while we are taking care of those who we know and are on our shop floors, mm -hmm. there seems to be lack of visibility on the well-being and status of those who are we know we are they are engaged with us contractually and through our supply chains but we ha we don't have a way of checking at this point in time and it took a pandemic for this to come to light yeah i think so so a little bit of the just two seconds also on on the history of it right the reason it the contractual workforce became such a big part of our employment model right. as a country and industry is that we needed flexibility with the waxing and waning cycle of the business you wanted to have more people less people along with that of course. now flex was fine and it would have stayed fine but I think over a period of time it devolved into out of sight out of mind and let's keep it that way and right? no real paperwork no real paperwork the contractor will take care of it etc mm. etc right so that out of sight out of mind that invisibility uh, is what led to this state that you saw blowing up during the pandemic where then suddenly there was a realization that we actually don't have knowledge on 8x of the population that is really keeping these business chains afloat. Right. So now, so then you went ahead and you did surveys and you spoke yeah. to these companies? We actually created with our NGO partners. So our, our industry partners were very keen that we don't create a framework in a commonsensical manner. We get the expertise of worker organizations like the ones I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that's how we evaluate industry and its performance. You know, how are its systems really taking care of the vulnerability of these workers? So we actually created a framework and we use that framework to help the company first self-assess itself and then we go to the ground uh, and speak with a representative sample of all informal functions on a site. Right. To really tell the company, here's what you thought your system looks like for these workers and here is how they experience it, right? Where are the systemic gaps? Let's correct them. And that's been our journey with six, over 60 companies now in the last four years. Okay, so then can you tell us a little bit about the findings? What is the kind of gap that they're seeing? Do the companies feel as if, hey, but we're doing enough for these workers, but the workers are saying nothing is coming our way? So I think there, is a, there are a couple of gaps, right? One is the gap in the systems itself. How much do you know? We always tell our mm. companies when they self-assess themselves, we see that the you know their their insight on their own workers is a hundred percent on all our indicators. Right. The insight on the contractual workers becomes a little lesser. Mm -hmm. And by the time we reach the supply chain, we eventually had to remove that line of questioning because the answer was don't know anything. Don't know anything. Anything, right? Okay. So uh, that's the first point of revelation that we had. The second point of revelation was okay, we said okay, chalo, contractual workers. Now we know what we have to correct. How are we going to do it? It cannot be a demand and abide way of taking people through that change, right? There has to be a dialogue bridge between the principal company and the contractor to say, here is where we want to go. Right. This is what we do for our workers. Here is what we want you also to ensure ESI, CPF, appointment letters, etc. Mm -hmm. What is it going to take? What is it going to take by way of budget? What is it going to take by way of know-how? What is the support you need by way of how many people you need for doing this for you know your 200, 100, 50, 20 people? That conversation also was new we experienced when we entered, right? It was like, this is a code of conduct, sign it. We've asked you to do it, do it. It's not right? right? Because the kind of exposure that a principal company has because of being a global player or being exposed at the top of the apex of a supply chain mm -hmm. 
your next contractor and supplier doesn't have that same exposure and therefore the same motivation. They are not right. under the scrutiny. Nobody has asked them. They've been able to manage by keeping their worker numbers low, having five companies to saturate their entire workforce. You've been able right. to keep yourself low, right? If you really want to, your aspiration to become their aspiration, it requires a dialogue. And that is what was the second nature of the gap. Mm -hmm. The third was we found that in many places, even within the company, the guidelines were a bit open to interpretation. Vague. Overtime tends to be a very, very highly interpreted compliance, you know, across. It really depends on the rule of the area rather than the law of the land right. as to whether it's going to be 2x OT or not quite, right? Okay. So how do you ensure that as a corporate to a company, there is actually standardized guidelines on these areas to the entire expanse, geographic expanse of the business. The second was the guidelines are there, but the monitoring and evaluation is a bit iffy. How do you check for anomalies in your system? Again, a real simple example would be hours of work of a worker, mm -hmm. right? Usually maintained in registers for this cadre of the workforce. Right. Now, if, if you only had a biometric to back it, there can't be that uh, there's always that dissonance between the worker and the contractor. Ki kitne ghante kaam kiya, yeah, right? right? Over time, hua tha ya nahi hua tha. Hmm. If you have an, a system like a biometric, that it's relatively easier to look for anomalies and say it's not one's word versus the other's word. There's actually a system to check for accurate information. Right. And the third are areas of innovation, right? So we realized, for instance, uh, it could be innovation, it could be sharing know-how. We realized, for instance, that uh, when companies went on to, say, sharing the same aspiration with their suppliers, the suppliers actually came and said, sir, I don't have the vendors to help me do the CSIC compliance. I have a one-person HR team. How do you expect me to take on this big load of getting running around and getting you know paperwork done? So one of our uh, partner companies and actually got on board an ESIC vendor and said, okay, here is a consultant to standardize. Who uh, can help you, know, you do the paperwork. Do, do it. So these are areas where you have to really go in and say, where is the break point? What is the challenge? It cannot be you're doing well, poorly, or you know, really badly. It has to be like, okay, here is where we are. To get to that next level, what is it going to take? And how can we co-solution on getting that to happen? That is where the social compact works as an enablement platform that A, brings this voice of the workers to the principal company to say here is what they think right and if you're having if you want to improve the system that manages them hmm. and is responsible for their well-being it has to accommodate their insight voice experience as well so that's the big deficit that we are trying to fill and the second one is that we've chosen not to be a certification uh, statement of judgment so to say for the ah, that you won't certify i see ah, I like understand. you're doing really badly and thank you very much and walk out right, right. or this is terrible and let's make a lot of noise and then walk out. We actually get and stay there with them to be able to then see, okay, what actions should be prioritized from the gaps that have been identified? How do we solve one after the other? So in some of our companies, for instance, it was that you need to have a grievance redressal mechanism. Otherwise, if you don't hear, SOCO can't keep coming in all the time. Mm. If you can't hear from your workers on a perennial basis, this will always be a spot checked. Uh, listening mechanism and, and not a continuous a flow yeah i see so now but let's bring a little bit of uh, more color to the plight of these informal sure. workers in the formal workspace what are the kinds of uh, lacks that you're seeing in terms of say even pay slips or appointment letters and what is the scale of the problem so I already shared about job contracts, right? Dissatisfactory or satisfactory job contracts. We Just saw in 2% 2 of con companies' contractors. Uh, same thing for something that is a compliance, having an ICC uh, to ensure posh uh, mm. compliance, for instance. We saw that only in 50% of our companies, right? A grievance redressal mechanism in only 14% of our companies, right? So well, they had these for their former workers. workers but not for the contract employees or the supply chain workers. Yeah, and you have to understand it's a bit tricky also. So it has to be done in a thought through manner. It can't be coincidental. Right. Because all companies have contractual workforce uh, 
to not have an employer employee relationship with them right mm-hmm. so when you are ensuring that you are extending certain services or mandating the contractor to ensure certain services then it has to be done via the contractor and not for by the principal company themselves right so right. job contracts cannot be issued to the contractual workforce by the principal company but we tell them here's the format mandate the format to the entire contractor base you have so that the level of detail that makes it a proper document is standard then they can do what they want and issue it in their name and that's fine you don't have to do the issuing of it right so now the overall view of the private sector is that they are profit minded and that they are only looking for the you know top line bottom line so do you find that they are actually willing to make these changes because this is going to add to their cost it's going to add to their compliance it's going to add to a lot of things that might have an impact on their profits it'll add to effort first sharan right that is the catch everything else is a proxy to that hmm. big you know big haul that is going to have to be done because we are running supply chains that are not visible and to turn them into visible supply chains will be a, a big haul right so that effort is what gets proxy indicator such as cost bahut bad jayega we will become unviable etc the system is what is really the thing that will you know require a change it will require people to want to stand behind it and ensure that it is running the way it should be running companies i wouldn't say that because we have been in the space for the last 4 years i would say that companies are just flocking and doing this uh, you know despite all the cost and effort involved in it they need to be convinced they could be convinced a couple of things one there are some tailwinds right there is a global pressure there's a global opportunity and a global pressure the global opportunity is that india is becoming the more coveted partner of choice for business as compared to some other mm-hmm. uh you know geographies in the region uh the hindsight of that also then is that there is an increasing demand for greater vigilance and visibility of human rights in the supply chain so it's a it's a catch right absolutely and, and that's how we would also like industry to see it that there is an opportunity at stake but it comes with a responsibility right and today you know for instance the european law that has just come out on business and human rights due diligence mm-hmm. today it's not asking you to be a stellar performer today it's asking you to just know do you know the risks right. in your supply chain right can you make them visible can you say what you're doing about it nobody is asking for a beautiful 100% performance uh, you know on the report card this is the time to start and just to reiterate right now what you have found is that most companies don't even know yeah, the about visit. the state of and the informal was, worker yes they if you asked a company just stop by and do a survey just ask a company how many workers in your contractual base how many in your supply chain i'll be surprised if you get a ready answer let alone how many hours are these people no, working no, and all of that no, no. right and so now overall you you mentioned that you know uh, india is becoming a more vital part of the global supply mm-hmm. chain and all of that mm-hmm. so are you seeing a trend of uh, these companies opting for more of these contract workers rather than a formal work uh, a formal employee i think the jury is out given the impending labor courts on where the model is going to go hmm. right uh, but i think because of the law changing whether here or in european countries i don't think the model today or the repercussions today are felt right in any way if you asked indian companies over here are you already preparing if you're part of the european supply chain to get yourself more in line i would say that nothing has sunk in just yet we because we are in the business of doing this leverage it as a tailwind and say you've got to be future ready it's already here right right uh will companies choose more contractual workforce i think they may want to but i don't think that is going to be possible it's going to become a little bit redundant if you wanted to really do fair mm-hmm. by everybody who was blue collar in your ecosystem and you didn't want it to become uh, you weren't really looking at it as a cost reduction mechanism it would just become redundant the only advantage that you would lose by having everybody on your payroll is the flex challenge which is a fair challenge 
you can't let people go and come in uh, you know because you your business waxes and wanes and so the new labor codes have something called roles that can be fixed term employment roles right. where you can define the period of the role and thereby have the person on it for just that long but i would wait and see how that goes before i make a comment on that so yeah so uh, there is, there is a lot that uh, governments at the center and at the states can do i mean there are things like the labor codes there are uh, legislation on gig workers as well there's that's a thing that a few states are now trying to implement but the equal partner in all of this has to be the employer and uh, what like let's say the one two three top three things that companies need to get moving on right now to because this has implications even in our data gathering if yeah. our formal sector workers you have the formal sector but most of the workers are not being counted then we don't know our unemployment employment situation we don't know a lot of things yeah i think the first thing would be gather data on your entire supply chain map the layers of your supply chain first right. let let's just know where does it start and where how does it end at you mm. right how many layers in that and what is your influence or market share in all of those partners because that's the only way we call it centers of influence right right this is not something that is being changed because the law is asking you to change it you're aspirationally changing something so what is your influence on those layers of your supply chain to be able to demand greater fairness for their workforce and not your workforce right. but you want a chain to become clean so one is gather and map your supply chain and start knowing from the supply chain how they are doing on some of these areas i want to take a second to say what these areas are absolutely all the way from wages and whether you know people are getting minimum wages over time etc to the area of occupational health and safety and again a massively ignored area as you go down the supply chain um and then coming into say some of the more aspirational areas such as what is the gender disaggregation in the uh, mm -hmm. company uh what is the skilling and growth opportunity the company offers to these workers because you're talking 200 million workers that's pretty much two thirds of our bottom of the poverty line right. right so if you have to think about say industry at 100 or india at 100 what is that change that step change you're going to make to unlock our productivity and also unlock growth for these 200 million people and last but not the least we at at the social compact at least uh, run a few worker facilitation centers because we realized that a lot of these uh, areas of vulnerability such as ration having access to government entitlements and benefits are something that is not industry's mandate but something that the government has been ensuring needs to ensure Right. and so getting the workers linkage to those necessities and those benefits is something they struggle with because a lot of them are migrants aadhar card number se connected nahi hai everything falls down right there right so it starts with those basic banal disconnects in how the system is designed and how it plays out for our mm -hmm. highly informal migrant population and then taking them all the way to getting those linkages getting those benefits so starting with visibility on wages occupational health and safety gender any kind of discrimination to then moving on to saying okay how can we grow this this chain of ours by 3x by investing in skilling and growth of this entire workforce and how can we enable access to uh, government entitlements through models such as the worker facilitation center but to me the core of this issue and i come back to it seems to be the motivation of the company itself to actually do these things they could very easily just be like this is our supply chain the contractor will handle it it's really not our business as long as we are getting the supplies at whatever price that we had set in the contract mm -hmm. that's all we care about why should we go the extra mile and do the do the rest of all of these things that you've talked about for two reasons one that it has a direct linkage to productivity whether we don't have data mm -hmm. you know when we started and we said okay let's build a business case because moral case is too altruistic right uh but we found that indian data on productivity uh linkages of doing right by this demographic of workers is non existent from the indian context right but i'll give you a simple example mm -hmm. 
you have a factory, there are 500 workers in the factory, you have a housekeeping staff of 10 people. Right. The housekeeping staff doesn't come for a week. What do you think is going to happen to the productivity of your factory staff? It'll fall. So I don't have, I don't need data. It's a simple equation that is very evident. And yet, if I went and said to a company, for instance, there's a direct relationship between doing right by your housekeeping staff and your productivity, you would laugh at me and say, I don't think so. Right. right. So it's about realizing who makes this equation. And the pandemic was helpful because it blew it in our face. Mm. Things actually stopped for three four months for industry and we realized that our dependence on the informal layers, core or support was very high to run business as usual. We leveraged that moment and of course the championship of a few fo you know, forward looking uh, business leaders to campaign relentlessly and say, you have run it like this for 70 years, it can't go on like this for another 70 years, otherwise you can only see and expect incremental growth. Yeah. You cannot expect the change you want to see in productivity, in industrial growth, in well-being of everyone, leaving no one behind. If you don't even know who you're leaving behind, you Absolutely. don't even have the numbers out there. You don't even know when we sometimes, I'll just give you an example, when we sometimes speak to our companies and say, you know, you've got to bring this workforce, you've got to think about how many levels of growth they're going to have in their entire work life with you. And usually the answer is one, from helper to supervisor. Right? And that's it. That's it, right? Yeah. And so they're like, how can I? You know, there are thousands and I have maybe five or ten managerial slash early stage white collar roles. How can I progress them yeah. there? But that's the whole point. This shouldn't have been a realization today. It should have been a realization a long time ago that you actually have at your disposal. Let me put the tone on the other side. You have at your disposal about five to 10,000 workers, how will you reimagine growth of your business and your entire supply chain by thinking, can I now start training this helper to actually do line management mm -hmm. and take the supervisor to start three more lines? Do I think like that? Do I even have a model that allows me to think that I've actually everybody who comes into my system, sure, maybe a pair of hands to begin with, but can be cultivated into something more. Of course. Right? And uh, as you said, uh, step one in all of that is first you need to know the numbers. Yeah. But uh, on that note, uh, this was a wonderful discussion. It's, it's given me at least and hopefully all of our viewers a lot of clarity about this large segment of workers that is not being catered to in any sort of formal way at all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing, Sharon. Absolutely. Uh, in addition to knowing the numbers, you need to know the plight and ideally their voice, their experience. Right. So that's the big gap because someone speaking on their behalf is one thing and you hearing from the horse's mouth is another thing. So if you involve them in knowing about their plight and therefore design the systems around them, mm -hmm. that's a win-win. You know the numbers, you know the scale of the problem, you know the nature of the condition right. and then you can move on and change it. Wonderful. So hopefully all of this will happen. But thank you and thank you thank so much you. for watching.